Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Hey, welcome back, everybody. We do everything online these days. You always wonder, is your data safe? We take it for granted. And then you hear these stories of, of data breaches and, and sensitive information getting into the hands of uh, attackers and those looking for ransom. Uh, on your information. We're going to dig deeper into this today, get a kind of lay of the land in terms of what's being done, what is done. And we got a professional. He's our professional of the year, and he's got a company that propels organizations forward, re really re revolutionizing their IT systems, making them more efficient, and most importantly, ensuring compliance. His company is Business Automation Experts, and he's Matt Lepowski. And he joins us today. Hey, Matt, how you doing? Hey, pretty good. Thanks for having me. Oh, so glad you're here. So many questions, so much going on in terms of data. Let's start with what your company does broadly. Can you explain? Sure. So I'll back it up a little bit because we're about 20 years old. And I remember challenges around data when I was in automotive. So we always had things that we were trying to do to improve our processes. You know, if you're applying technology, it's to benefit the organization. And so there is always a tug and pull on what we can do when we can do it. And I worked for a company in New Jersey. They moved me out here to run their IT. And from there, I kind of spawned a passion to work with smaller organizations, certainly ones in the area. I prefer to help my neighbors. And then to begin with, it was mostly how do we improve um, procedures and things? Because many times companies want to grow, right? If you're small, you don't want to stay small. And usually there's some sort of impediment to that growth. And technology can be a great way to unlock that. So my background is really software engineering and things. I've written quite a few different things for uh, hospitals and then other organizations. We became... A little, we kind of got dragged into the cyber side of these things uh, around 2015, a little bit earlier, actually, because the healthcare space become became the target. And there's a few reasons for that, why it certainly has maintained that status. But to begin with, it was about the price of a health record. And back, you know, before that, everybody was after your bank records, which was not really a surprise, right? And the banks got wise and put various things in place. And then threat actors sort of said, oh, well, it's hard to attack a bank, but look at these hospitals, they're super easy. And the value of a health record it was about 50, 60 times. So it was easier to steal and you got paid more to, to take the data. Can I jump in here? Why is the health record more valuable? Well, you have way more in it. In a bank record, I maybe know your... Uh, social security number, I know your date of birth, I know your name, maybe I know your address. A health record, I'm going to know all of that, plus your mother's maiden name, you know, what diseases you have, how many times you went to the hospital, what were your current diagnoses, what are your allergies, a whole range of things. So the more I know, as you kind of alluded to on the data side of it, the more I can do to you, right? Because I can kind of attack you if I wanted to exploit some some things. So the reason that we have HIPAA, I don't. I remember when Bill Clinton signed that into law, right? And the reason that we have data protection in healthcare was actually a nurse in Florida, and what he was doing was taking records, and he would sell those records. And I think like Arthur Ashe became one of the ones that got caught up in this, and so he testified to Congress. He said, "We can't allow people to just take this health information because his HIV status came out." And that's why our health records, HIV and mental health, are really, really protected. Like, if there's ever a problem with that, getting out in the open, there's really wow. big fines for that. And then there's just, you know, well, they lost control. They call that a breach. And what attracted the threat actors in was the price of a record. You know, it was the ease and the price. And what's kept them has been, because of that law, we have to have insurance, and the insurance companies say this is a covered event. And so when they started doing the ransomware and other things, the insurance companies pay the bill. And so then it's like, great, they raise the ransom. So 
it's just nonstop. And unfortunately, in healthcare, we have a lot of older systems. Those aren't the easiest thing to replace, and they aren't the easiest thing to defend because there's things that were built where they didn't really think about, oh, maybe I should encrypt this data or add some additional protections to this. And so we've had to grow that side of our business quite a bit because the clients needed a lot there. And so we've been kind of pushing. I don't necessarily like dealing with that situation, but I see opportunities for people to improve. Um, So I'll say a challenge in healthcare is we have a lot of disparate systems and then we have a lot of different people that are doing different things in there. So that's very hard to defend. And we can now leverage more tools today that will give us the ability to um, monitor what's going on in there and then say, that doesn't look right. Why is Dr. So-and-so, you know, going over here when he doesn't normally go there? And so then you can have a human look at it or you can have the computer say, nah, disable Dr. So-and-so's account so that he can't go anywhere. And so those things are now very available and much more affordable. And unfortunately, hospitals will look at the bank systems, you know, because they're like, oh, the banks put this stuff in. And a lot of that technology is 20 years old and pretty much all of the threat actors know how to get around it. So you're basically using sticks and stones against people that have rockets and stuff. And they need to kind of, again, update and upgrade and take advantage of things that are out there. So we've spent a lot of time kind of helping them navigate those choppy waters. In your opinion, and I know there's a lot involved in the healthcare records, you know, it goes right down to the uh, the patient portals. Then we have within the practices, there's all different types of software that hold those records. One of the companies I know is Nextech. There's a whole bunch of them. In your opinion, Matt, overall, I'm talking broadly here, do you think that medical records in the United States are fairly safe or we have a problem? Well, all right. <laughs> I would say... Most doctor's offices, so you probably remember, uh, we had the recession in 2008, right? And so they passed the thing for the High Tech Act, and that really kicked in around 2010, 2012-ish. So we went from about, say, 30% of organizations, well, I'll flip it, 70% to 75% of everybody was paper, right? And the government said, eh, it's not so great. So they flipped it. And now it's much higher and then, you know, 90% covered by health records, right? No more paper. Um, That also created the other problem. That's why 2015 was also kind of seminal because if they tried to attack you 2009, they'd have to back up a truck, you know, take boxes, start photocopying, much harder to do it, right? Now it's all digital, eh, download it and download 5,000 records, no problem. A lot of doctors have outsourced those things so i would say like if you're going to your doctor's office it's not really a problem because he it's not his system it's somebody else's system right and they have the resources to try and defend these things they do get attacked but they're pretty much up on the game so you'll you've mentioned like next gen they're pretty good athena health um a, a range of those and then in hospitals we have um uh Cerner is a big one that usually runs on prem. So that one's kind of scary. And then um, Epic, we do a lot of stuff with Epic. And that one's, uh, we'd have to go into the architecture. I can't explain that simply for people, um, but it, it can be on prem. A lot of it's kind of hosted. So it's pretty safe in that perspective. But there are, um, <laughs> so one of the things that came out with the High Tech Act is, we have to meaningfully use these systems, right? Quote unquote. And that meant we had to upload stuff to health information exchanges and we had to connect from doctor to doctor. And that's why you have like 5,000 portals. If you ever go to a doctor and like, well, you, you want to get this, you got to get this log on. You want to go here, you got to get this log on. Go. And so they have a system or it was part of the law or meaningful use. I wouldn't say it's the law, but you had to upload the stuff and they never really had a great business model for health information exchanges. And so there's this huge honeypot of everybody's data and they don't necessarily have great defenses there. 
So even if they don't break your hospital, they have a copy of the hospital somewhere else. And so then that becomes a little more interesting to, to work with. It, it also becomes confusing for the, the patient as we center yeah. on healthcare. Yes. Uh, I went to the doctor recently, had a you know, minor cold, and the practice is CityMD, but, mm-hmm. but then I get a text from Summit Health. Yeah. I'm like, what's Summit Health? <laughs> and I've, you, know, you figure it out, that, you know, it's a portal, it's a login, um, but everything yeah. is so apparently disconnected and like, you know, great word, honeypot, where everything is all hanging out. Um, when you yeah. think about it, when you just fathom what's going on here, it's pretty scary. And I never realized until you said it how deep the information goes. You know, mother's maiden name and all that. You brought back a memory at a primary care doctor in 2000. And mm-hmm. he was part of a small practice. Great guy, kind of old school. And that's when they were starting to switch over to electronic records. And yeah. he was bucking the system. He's like, uh-huh. you know, I, I just want to write things down. That's how I work. And yeah. he actually left the practice. And I, I, he, might have, he might have left the medical industry because he didn't want to adhere to it. That was his, just his belief. Yeah, yeah, that, that definitely happened. A lot of what they did in hospitals is they used scribes. So you, pretty much anybody, any doctor that is, I'll say, 65 and up. Because, I mean, look, in medicine, you know, in tech, we always have to get educated and, you know, constantly invest. And then they usually try to kick us out at some point in healthcare. We keep them around quite a while and you want to work with those guys that have been around a long time. Cause they've seen, you know, like every disease there is and sure. they know how to deal with a lot of situations. And, you know, if you go to a younger doctor, they're going to do 500 tests and then they'll eventually get to the answer. Whereas you can go to some, some of the other guys and they can look at you and say like, well, here you need this, yep. you know, and, the hospitals need to have those resources because a lot of them are teaching hospitals, right? And they usually would use medical students or others and they'll come in and then they follow that doctor around because they usually have to round with them anyways. And so, hey, type this for me, you know, or he'll, you know, have stuff and repeat it back to me. Okay, do that. And a big challenge in healthcare right now, they call it burnout. And if I spent 15 minutes with you as a patient, right? It would take me maybe 30 minutes to finish the documentation on the computer, click this, type that. And that's brutal for Mm. these guys. And, you know, if we wanted to just increase our capacity as a health system, if we can drop, you know, 20% off of their workload, you know, that gives them hours left in their day. They could do more for us. And there's a lot going on in that space. That's why we have automation in our name. I've done a lot of things for doctors. Before the whole um, distraction with cyber, we would do a lot of things with the medical record systems to save steps in there. We still do that, um, but it's not as often because they, they click on a screen, 50 options. And there's things you can do to say, well, doc, what's your most frequently asked you know, most frequently prescribed drugs. And then you just give him the 10, 20 that there are. He clicks it, you know, he can rename things. There isn't a lot of consistency in medical terminology, even though, you know, like we haven't made new humans, but every doctor kind of describes things in a different way. And so there's a lot of variance in medical language when you get out there. Tell me about the automation and what you offer in the medical arena, how you make things more streamlined for a medical practice. Sure. So, like I said, my background's in software. And originally, it was kind of um, building building these systems for practices or others to, uh, let's say, deal with prescription processes and things. And in the last 10 years, a lot of that got combined, right? Because it used to be You bought one system, you put something in there, and then you had to hook it to another system to run prescriptions. And then, so again, you see a lot of this in healthcare. Like there's 15 different things that are going on just to get something done. And we then switched more towards what you would call robotic process automation. So those are, um, there's two ways to basically connect systems together. 
One way would be back end. And in healthcare, we use a system called a standard called HL7, health language seven, something. And that's just a standard to say, this system will send a message to this other system and they can kind of talk to each other. So a lot of that exists in hospitals and other organizations. That's great. The front end usually will have things that are way beyond what HL7 can pass around. So a lot of that extra work, there will be a lot of compliance questions and other things that occur for the doctor. So like, did you ask him about this? Did you do this? Did you check that thing? Why did you do this? Blah, blah, blah. That doesn't really factor into a message that goes from one system to another. It's kind of you're in one system and they want all these extra questions answered. And what you can do now is kind of give those doctors some tools so they'd like to use uh, audio systems, right? Like Dragon is a common system that they use. And they can put in certain kind of short phrases. So they'll just say, you know, broken arm, severe. And then it'll just load that stuff in there for them so they don't have to say the same thing 20 times a day. And there's tricks and tips that we usually work with them on so that they can get through their day a lot faster because, you know, most doctors actually like humans. They really like to treat patients. They like to make a difference. They don't like to do paperwork. When, that, think- when that's going on, Matt, is that when they're with the patient? Because I've, got, I've gone to some specialists where they use a dictation machine, you know, yeah. click, blah, 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 click, and then somebody transcribes it. What mm-hmm. you're describing, would it be when they're with the patient? So you do, they're doing a one-on-one and then, you know, press a button and say, patient broken arm, severe. Would that be done during the um, during the exam? It's going that way. So they are using stuff called ambient transcription. So they'll put, the way you can kind of describe it is like an Alexa kind of thing that will be in the room with you and the patient. And so then we can do things with that where uh, the doctor comes in, you know, and they announce who they are. I'm treating patient blah, blah, blah. And it kind of, okay, now we know what record we're starting to work with. And then he can kind of say, well, how are you feeling today? Tell me about your allergy. What about this? How is this drug working? How is it not working? And they can capture those things and then document immediately for that. And in that process, they can say, I want, you know, treatment plan 12 or something like that. And it will then load that set of pre-built options. So the doctor could then after the patient's there, click and fix anything that they have to do. But usually they do it after the patient. So if they came in, they talk to you, they usually still paper. They will jot stuff down because they have shorthand for all the things that they do. They will have like a, I work with a lot of doctors. They do like these one page template things. And so they just have the common things and they circle things. Then they go back and they, take that and basically transfer it into the system. And they will say, you know, they'll click on the spot and they'll say broken arm, severe paragraph, you know, and then they'll click on something else and then they keep going. And that is why I was saying it's, it's not even like 50, 50. It is more lopsided to the paperwork side. Wow. Amazing to hear that in 2024. Yeah. People are working on it. Yeah. And, and everybody every everybody has their own style. You know, doctors used to writing it down on paper. I would think even in this um, age of technology, you know, you have tablets like the Remarkable, that maybe yes. it could be you know, written on a tablet and then inputted, you know, through intelligence um, where you don't have to, it seems like there's two steps there. Yeah. So one of the projects we worked on earlier on that was, Like I said, I I worked with a doctor. He had a form that was front and back. And so it was not really a great use of his time either because he kept, you know, copying this thing and then he would send it to a a company and then they would bind it so they could come and tear off a paper. And then if he had another situation and he had to go over to the other one and tear off that other paper, and then that was how he would capture things. And then that would get scanned. Then it would go to India. They would type. Then it would come back. And then he'd say, nope, that's wrong. Then they had to fix it. And he was doing things for pain management. And if you've been in pain, you don't want to be in pain, right? 
the systems are set up such that when we started with that doctor, it would take about a week, right? So if you saw him on a Monday, he would get a report probably on a Friday. So that's why they would schedule you for the following Monday. And that whole time period, you're in pain. We took that process down to 30 seconds. So he went with his, we just used some standard forms. We just had things on a computer. He just touched the stuff. And then if it needed the expanded thing, we just, he would click it. And then that extra thing would show up. Then he would click that stuff. And we would translate that, if you will. We take that input and then we knew the paragraphs that were connected to that. So we worked in his parlance to say, you know, it would have the word that he would know and he would hit that and he knew what that meant. And that would be very consistent. So he didn't really have to tweak it much until there was a situation where you would have a patient that would be a very severe situation. Maybe they were in an automatic, an automotive accident and they lost a limb and X you know, like rare, but in that situation, he would have to do more work, but you could knock out 95, 98% of his visits. And that meant you saw him on a Monday, you'd see him again on a Wednesday. So you could get through a treatment cycle a lot faster. So we effectively built, we built his practice. It was able to expand by tenfold. Wow. One doctor could do 10 X and that was how they used to do the sales of medical records and things. They would come in, Oh, we're going to help you. You know, it'll make things better. And what they used to do was you could code from a, a, um, in Medicare, you have levels, right? So if you're, if you're there for a visit, you know, level one is like five minutes, level two is like 10 minutes and then three, four, five, right? And no doctor would ever bill a five because one, you had to have all kinds of documentation for it. And two, it usually triggered some kind of an audit, right? Somebody knocked on your door, doctor, you know, there's no way you're this thorough, right? Prove to me that we should pay you, you know, two, $300 for that visit uh, because we don't think that you did that. And the medical record systems, what they started with was doc, if you're going to see a patient repeatedly, we can just copy everything from the previous visit to the next visit. Then you just make the tweaks because, you know, most humans don't miraculously cure in a, you know, a day and the changes are pretty minimal. So then they could basically bill level four visits constantly because they would always be afraid to upcode that. And so <laughs> this, the unintended side effect when the government put all of these medical record systems into the hospitals and every, all of a sudden the level codes went way up and Medicare freaked out because they said, this is insane. Everybody's be, you know, they can meet the standard and uh, our bills are way up. So you, you went from like all everything level two, level three to everything like three, four or four or five. And <laughs> we're paying wow for uh, that benefit. Um, so I don't know, is that great that we have really detailed records now? Uh, it's great for those threat actors because you know they have more to download, but it's interesting to see all those you know confluence of events and things. And then you introduce you know the X factors of humans coming in and saying, well, we can we can steal this, we can, you know, encrypt it. And so you just can't control it. We can do uh, a range of things. And so, so there's so much going on here. I didn't even consider insurance. So now, you know, you have the office visit, then they have yeah. to talk to the insurance company. Your medical records are going there. Then it's available for the patient on a portal. Um, how, and I know it's a complicated question. How mm -hmm. do we ensure that that data is truly safe? because it's accessible in so many different areas. Yeah, so it's kind of security through obscurity right now because it is sliced up. There's a lot of things in a lot of places. Sure. So if you took the insurance side of it, they're basically banks. They don't take a full record. What they do is they basically require a doctor to upload like a PDF. Or something. Like they don't move that record. They kind of take a report 
from it. And they're just doing that okay. to slow down the doctor, right? Because they're, they're going to say, well, we're not, you probably have seen or heard of the prior authorizations things. That's kind of the, the new fun game insurance companies have. So they basically say like everything requires uh, a medical review on their side. And, you know, the default setting is no. So you have to do all this extra work and your doctor typically has to call the hospital, the insurance company doctor to say, oh yeah, let's go forward with this MRI or do this or do that. And it's just designed to create speed bumps in the, in the system. And you constantly see that back and forth. So even if we were able to make the doctors even more efficient, the insurance side will create another set of speed bumps or other things to try and, again, make it more difficult to get something done. So to better understand that, I want to make sure I have it clear. It, 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 it makes me feel a little bit better if I'm understanding this right. So the insurance companies only get a slice of the information. They basically yes. get what they need to process it, but they're, they don't have, they don't have their, your hands in their hands into everything. No. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. They will have us. So the payment system works on, there's two parts. So there's a diagnosis. We went through a huge thing that was, we used to have ICD-9 codes, right? So there were like 4,000 codes. And that's what a doctor would figure out. That's why we have doctors. They say, you know, here's what's wrong with you. And then with that code, you have what's called a CPT code. And that's, uh, that's what you do, right? So that's what you get paid for. And we went from ICD-9 to 10. So we went to 60,000 codes. So now it's like a mess, right? Because you got it. You can now, if you broke a bone, they want to know which bone, what hand, you know, and then was it the first time they saw you? Is it a result of something else? It takes a lot longer to code that. And the insurance companies require that plus what did we do? And usually the CPT codes are behind this rule engine that says, unless this is what's wrong, we're not paying for this. And that makes some sense, right? Like came in with a headache. Why is he going to take your gallbladder out? So they use that to their advantage. And usually their rules are based on those CPT codes, what you do codes. And they have extra rules that that uh, creates. So the doctor, all he really says is, here's the diagnosis. This is what I did. That's all he ever has to say. You know, it's the insurance number ID, right? You know, like, what's your number? Sure. You know, it's that data service. He was here. This is what's wrong with him. And this is what I did. And then that is supposed to create, you know, that's an invoice and then money flows from that. So not everything goes there. Gotcha. I, I don't know how you do what you do. <laughs> it is so detailed as, and as an IT professional, I bet, you know, you probably joke along the side that you could probably be a doctor yourself knowing all these different things and codes. Um, we have a minute or two left. I want to pivot over to information in general because it's it's still trending. The Ticketmaster breach. Yeah. Um, your overall thoughts on how that data got out there and, and how it actually did. I, I understand it is it was on a cloud and somebody yeah. had access to the cloud. Yeah. So there's vendors, right? Ticketmaster, they are a monopoly, but they're more payment monopoly, right? They still have all those other vendors that were in the woodpile. And you have a ton of different systems. And what you're seeing is legislative changes and things coming out that are saying, you can't just say, ah, the third party, that's their issue. We dealt with it in healthcare. So another one of those changes with high tech, it used to be the original law. If your vendor screwed up, the hospital was still the problem. Like, so that's why the insurance was always at the hospital level. And they now have things called business associate agreements where they can transfer the problem. So if you're a vendor, you have to sign this thing. So then if you have a problem, you get sued. You have to have insurance. Like I have to have a BAA for my company to do work in healthcare. Therefore, I have to carry a lot of insurance to be in the industry. Ticketmaster, they don't have those kinds of rules. Wow. And the stuff doesn't, it's, you know, we have more maturity in different spaces and you kind of see some of the stuff through what they call the PCI DSS, which is remember target 
Target, they had this big problem where somebody came in and then they captured every swipe through there and they just had to do it on a store level. So they captured the whole stream. They didn't have to do it on each reader. And Target was like, you know, that's the bank's problem. The bank's like, no, you got to fix this. And then they created this thing. So if you want to have a credit card, you have to meet these rules. And it's not a government, it's banks. The banks made this up. And uh, Ticketmaster has various obligations from PCI DSS around how to control this. And obviously they didn't do it. And so their wow. their fees are going to go up from the banks because they're going to say, you know, you guys weren't doing what you're supposed to do. And it will there will be a knock-on effect. And on top of it, Ticketmaster is already under review for being a monopoly and manipulating the prices, you know, the whole stuff because sure. they own StubHub. So they they think that they're con- they're purposely moving seats uh, to StubHub to get resale value on things. Uh, but who knows? I'm sure attorneys will figure it out. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, as a consumer, and I got the letter, Ticket, ticket yeah. Master Breach, um, yeah. big fail in that oh, yeah. in the letter, it said you can check your... Um, just, you know, cybersecurity, you can check, you know, your, your, all your data here, click this link. And it was a link to a service that's, um, uh, overlooked by TransUnion. So I clicked, yeah. clicked the link and put it in. And every time I did it, I got a 404, meaning the, yeah. it was a dead link. And then this customer service number, the people, when I call customer service, didn't even know what it was, what it was about. And the number was provided. If you have an issue, call this number. Like a complete, it, it's almost as if like they were, Ticketmaster was tripping yeah. over its feed, uh, handled well, we, it poorly. We don't have time, but we could talk about this process. Uh, that's because of the insurance companies. So, P, you know, there's a breach, there's a PCI problem, they have insurance to cover these things. And so what happens is the insurance companies come in, they say, I'm making a claim. And the insurance companies have processes where that's why you got the letter. Right. So usually they bring in an attorney, they do some kind of an investigation, who got hit, what happened. Then you get the mail and you're like, we're going to pay for this type of thing. Here's your access code, whatever. That's all outsourced. That's not from Ticketmaster. Sure. And yeah, you think like these guys do this all the time and the paperwork's wrong. Somebody, because that was a mail merge document, right? So they had some data and then they just said, insert these things in here, send mail. And yeah. Stuff happens. It's unbelievable. I, I was so frustrated. I'm not even going to joke. Yeah. I clicked that link <laughs> 15 times over a span of like 10 days. I'm like, I can't, you can't be sending a letter out. You yeah. did something wrong. This can't be. It's got it. And it never worked. I took the letter and threw it away. It's like, yeah, and you know, it's a, and, and if there's any kind of settlement, what are you going to get? You know, $3 and 80 cents or whatever it comes down to with the class. Yeah, action. You're going to get a free ticket. Yeah. Yeah. May, that's never going to happen. Um, <laughs> Matt, great talking with you today. Love the insight. Um, if somebody has a, a business looking to lock down their, their data or sure. even a medical practice, um, or even just wants to have a conversation with you, what's the best way to find you? Well, I'm online, obviously a good number, I can give you my number, right? Sure. Uh, 732-356-2789. And happy to review things. Like I said, I'm very interested in helping uh, midsize companies that are trying to grow, deal with, there's a lot of pressure. You know, I have a small company myself. I know what's going on. Sure. What, what's your website, by the way? Uh, businessautomationexperts.com. It's Rolls off the tongue. Yeah. So there's actually a shorter version, which is the BAE hyphen LLC.com, but you can get us there. Uh, happy that you are the expert, our professional of the year. Uh, I'm going to be honest. We're way over time today on the show. Right. Uh, I could go on forever. This is, there's so many different pieces here in data that affects our daily, daily lives. Looking forward next time we get together. Thanks for being here today. Appreciate your time. Appreciate Talk it. To you later. Thanks. We'll be right back. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. 
when I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's, it's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house, and there's no catch. It'll be our very first home that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's going to be okay. 